Good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas. Uh, great to see you all. Thank you for joining your hearts together in worship with us today. We're glad that you're here. My name is Scott, and I'm the senior pastor of Sunlight. Uh, if it's your first time, let me also join my voice in welcoming you. We're glad you're here. Every time we gather together to worship, our purpose is to worship God and lift up the name of Jesus. So thank you for joining your heart to our purpose. And uh, I always say this, which is this, that the center or heart of our worship service is around this book, uh, the Bible. This is God's word. And uh, as a community, every time we gather together, we're always anticipating that as we open God's word, that God has something he wants to say to us. And we've been studying for the last number of weeks now the book of Daniel, and we're actually going to continue that series today doing something a little unique. Uh, we're going to turn to the New Testament, to Matthew chapter 2, and as we get into this, we're going to see how uh, Matthew 2 connects with the book of Daniel. So anyway, if you didn't bring your own Bibles, there's Bibles in the chairs around you. You can find the passage we're going to be looking at on page 1,501, 1,500. One, And I uh, just encourage everyone to have a Bible out and in front of you. I think it's so helpful to not only listen as I read from the Scripture, but also to follow along and just have the Bible in front of you. And I find so often that one of the way God talks in the midst of a service like this is that you'll have your eyes down on the page and there'll be things that God's showing you uh, from the page itself as you read along. And so I just always encourage people to have a Bible open and in front of them. The other thing I'd like to ask that you do is I'd like to ask that you join me in prayer. And what we're going to pray for is this, that God's Spirit would just move through this place, that each one of our minds and hearts would be receptive to whatever it is God wants to say to us. Uh, we're not a church where we gather together and go through sort of empty rituals or regular routines uh, just to check a box and say that we've done things. We gather together every week with the anticipation and expectation that God himself wants to meet us here, and he wants to speak to us, and he wants to deal with each one of us, and there's things that are happening in our life that God wants to speak into, and so we're anticipating always that we're going to hear God's voice, and that's the thing that we're going to pray for together. And so I'd like to ask that you join your hearts with mine, and we'll just lift them up to God and ask for that very thing. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful as we gather here today to be celebrating what you've done for us, particularly this season of the year, which is a season of faith and hope and joy and love. We're celebrating what you've accomplished through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We thank you that you're changing lives all around the world. But personally, we want to thank you because you're changing our life. We want to ask and pray, Lord, that the message of the gospel would impact each one of us in a very particular way today. That you tune our hearts and ready our minds so that we can receive whatever it is that you want to say. We know, Lord, that as we're gathered here, as we open your word, that you're a God who always speaks. And so we pray for the power of your spirit to blow through this place and to each one of our lives and hearts that you would whisper in each one of our ears just the thing we need to hear today. And so, Lord, we're, we're leaning in, we're yearning, and we're anticipating the work of your spirit as we read and study from your word. And we ask, Lord, that you would be at work in a mighty way, and we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Matthew chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 through 12, which speak about, at the time of Jesus' birth, the coming of wise men, or magi. We'll start in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And before we continue reading, let's just pause for a moment. 
And I'd like to talk about these magi, who were they, why were they there? And maybe I'll get into it this way, although I don't think the Bible needs any defense. There have been many people who have said, okay, come on. This has got to be the stuff of fairy tale and legend. In fact, even in Bible scholarship, there are so many scholars who, who have said this must be a kind of legend. It couldn't be possibly historical. And I, I'd like to just address that a little bit and say, although I don't think the Bible needs any defense, I think in light, especially of recent scholarship, in light of biblical archaeology and studies, people are coming more and more attuned to the fact that this is perfectly historically plausible, and that'll be a way of getting at who were these magi. Let's start with this. Magi were astrologers, and we even picked that up from this passage. They were watching the sky. They saw a star appear in the east, and they went to Jerusalem because they believed that this star was associated with the birth of a king. Now, um, I just want to show you that in the intellectual framework of the time, this would have been the kind of thing that intellectuals, scholars, the learned would have been doing. And these astrologers would have been considered the, the wise people, the philosophers, the scholars, the scribes of that day. One of the things that I've been doing over the last 15 years, I've taken an interest in ancient coins. I'd like to show you this one. This is uh, an ancient denarius minted by Caesar Augustus. In fact, if you look at the face of the coin, you can make out Caesar Augustus. On the back, it says Divus Julius. His father was Julius Caesar. And by the way, you can find this in any history book. It just so happened that when Julius Caesar died, there was for six days a comet that came close to the earth. And Caesar Augustus and the intellectuals at the time seized that moment and said that was his soul ascending into heaven. And that the comet was a sign that, in fact, Julius Caesar had become divine and was God. And Caesar Augustus, and I find this so interesting, as a result and part of the propaganda of the Roman Empire said, if Julius Caesar, my dad, is now God, then I am on earth the son of God. And uh, had coins minted just like this one with the, the comet on the back and the divine Julius written there in, in, uh, on the back. Anyway, I find this so interesting because, of course, you remember the Christmas story. Caesar Augustus is there, right? In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and everyone went to their own hometown to register, and there was a woman named Mary who was pledged to, you remember the Christmas story, right? Caesar Augustus is there. I find it so interesting that Jesus, the Son of God, was born in a time where the emperor on the throne was minting coins with propaganda that he was the Son of God. And one of the chief signs of that was a star, a comet, that had appeared in the sky. I just mentioned that because it was part of the intellectual framework of the day. The wise, the learned, the scholars, they were astrologers, and they looked to the stars and the heavens for signs of the birth and death uh, of kings. Second little piece of historical evidence. Uh, there were some Roman historians. These weren't Christian historians, just Roman historians at the time who had recorded in history, and we have their quotes, that there was a rumor that a king was going to be born in Judea. And so uh, I have a first quote here from a Roman historian named Suetonius. He uh, lived from 69 to 120 AD. And I want you to see what he wrote. He said, there had spread all over the Orient an old and established belief that it was fated for men coming from Judea to rule the world. So, listen, this guy wasn't a Christian of any kind. He was just a Roman historian. And he records that there was this rumor that had sort of been floating around for a long time. People believed this, that there was going to be this king that arises from Judea. Also, the Roman historian Tacitus, he was born in 56 AD. He wrote this, just confirming what I just said. The majority were convinced that from Judea would go forth men destined to rule the world. This rumor was so well known that in 70 AD, 
there was a Roman emperor, I guess at the time he was campaigning to be emperor, his name was Vespasian. And he, along with Titus, had been responsible for going to Jerusalem and totally ransacking Jerusalem and dominating Judea. And when he came back to Rome, he actually said, listen, there are all these ancient prophecies that everyone knows that it'll be a king from Judea who will ascend to the throne. And he said, that's me. Anyway, the simple point I'm making is this, that in the intellectual framework of the time, there was this idea that there would be this great king that would arise from Judea. Now, let me get more to the point, especially with this passage, and this will help us. We've been studying the book of Daniel, and I want to just, for those of you who hadn't been around, remind kind of the historical framework of the book of Daniel. In 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar, along with his armies, invaded Jerusalem and Judea. And they carried away the nobles, the court officials, the leaders, the skilled workers, the artisans, the business and thought leaders. They took, you know, a good group of people, maybe as many as 10,000, away into exile. And they took them away into exile. These were all the business and thought leaders. These were the intellectuals, the scholars, because they had this idea that they wanted to reprogram the culture of every country they conquered. It was in 586 B.C. that the Babylonians with Nebuchadnezzar went back they destroyed Jerusalem, and they carried the whole population away in exile. The reason I mention that is that Daniel, along with his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were among those who in the first group, 605 B.C., were taken away into exile. And you'll remember in Daniel chapter 1 that they went through this training, right? They went through the programming, the, the sort of social engineering that the Babylonians did, they were put into schools. They learned all the Babylonian you know, scholarship. They were scribes who became well-read and well-versed in the history and in the culture of, of Babylon. Anyway, the reason I bring this all up is this. Do you remember in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had this dream? He had this dream of a statue, and he couldn't figure out what it meant. Daniel 2 says this, So the king summoned the magicians the enchanters, the sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. And you recall that none of them could do it. Daniel was among them. And this is so interesting to me. The Greek version of the Old Testament says that these people were magi. They were magi from the east. Who were these magi? They were the magicians. They were the enchanters, the sorcerers, the astrologers. They were those who counseled the king. They were those who had this special education. They were the intellectuals. They were the elite. Uh, they were the leaders who, who, anyway, they were the thought leaders of Babylonian society, magi. And, you'll recall this from the book of Daniel, who became the chief of them? Who kept getting promoted? Do you remember? It was Daniel. He kept being promoted. He became like the chief Magi from among all the Magi, and in the Bible, in the book of Daniel, there is one prophecy after the next about a coming king. We know Daniel's writings survived. We know that because they're in our Bible. And here, I'll just give you one example, Daniel chapter 7. We haven't gotten there, but this is what it says. Daniel says, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion's an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. You see that? Daniel is prophesying about this coming king. And anyway, here's the point I'm making. It would not be unusual for a group of people who belong to that intellectual society to carry on the tradition of one of the greatest magi of all time and be aware of these kind of prophecies and be looking in the heavens at signs, looking to the stars to find out when and where this king that would be born in Judea would be. And here, I'm just making a simple point. This event is completely historically plausible in every way. One last thing, just for whatever it's worth. The Bible doesn't say what their names were. It doesn't even say how many there were. But 
Christian history and tradition not only records their names, but tells us who they were. Christian tradition says that their names were Melchior, Gaspar, and Belshazzar. Now, who remembers what name was given to Daniel? Belshazzar, which is a variant of that third name. There are some who believe that one of the three wise men could have even been named after this great, you know, magi, Daniel. We don't know if that's true or not, but, but maybe. Anyway, for whatever it's worth, uh, this is the only place in the Bible that talks about the magi, and it doesn't say what finally happened to them. But Christian history and tradition does say that they returned to the east, and that it was actually the disciple Thomas who when he was sent from Jerusalem to go preach the gospel, he went as far as India, maybe even China. And Christian history says that he met these three wise men again and was the one who baptized them and they all became Christian. Uh, whether that's true or not, that's what Christian history says. It's not in the Bible, but I at least personally find that interesting. And here, I'm only making a simple point. I've gone on about it, but here it is. Uh, although maybe at first glance, this sounds like legend or myth that some you know, scholars from the East would arrive at the birth of an obscure baby. Uh, I don't think it's that unplausible at all. I think if you understand the historical framework of the time, this just fits right in. I find it completely plausible. Listen, I don't think the Bible needs any defending. I'm not trying to do that. Just simply say, I think you can read it at face value as a historical event. Let's go on. Verse 3. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Okay, I feel like I've already had sort of the intellectual part of this sermon. So I don't want to do that. I'd like to just, for the rest of this time, become very practical. I think the main idea of this passage is so clear, you could just say it in a sentence. You have these scholars, these wise men, these intellectuals, who show up and they worship Jesus. And I think Matthew is just making a simple point, that the wisdom of the world showed up and worshiped at the feet of a superior wisdom in the Christ child. The wisdom of the world came and acknowledged and bowed their knees and worshiped in front of a superior wisdom, the wisdom found in this Christ child. And here, I want to make this practical because here's what I want to say. Even now, the wisdom of the Christ child is such that the wisdom of the world has to bow down and acknowledge how much more superior the wisdom of this Christ child is. Let's start this way. I'll just make an assertion. That the wisdom of this world is dated, time-bound, and always shifting. Um, here, we'll come at it this way. Here, some of you, you may be saying to yourself, wait a second. You know, the scholars of that time, the, the wise, the learned, the scribes, you mean, they thought that you could look up at the stars and that somehow in the stars there would be signs about what was happening down here among the history of human beings, that's ridiculous. And by the way, if you're thinking that, then you're not far off from where my point is going to be. Of course, we look at it today and we say, yeah, I mean, 
People who read the horoscopes to tell them what's going to happen in their life, that, that's ridiculous. Astrology, I mean, it's debunked. It's crazy. Uh, I agree. And here's the point I'm making. The wisdom of this world is always dated and time-bound and shifting. I'll, I'll try to make my point more close to home. So let's think about what the intellectuals, the scholars, the elite thought only 50 years ago, the kind of advice that was being dispensed. If you go back to the 1960s, here I'll start with this. Here's the cover of a magazine that was written to uh, teenage girls about, you know, the best way to comport yourself and live. And in this particular issue, <laughs> there's an article where they tell teenage girls that it'd be better even if you need glasses not to wear them because it's better to look good than to look well. Which I think is, I mean, that's ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, I'm a father of three daughters. I find that, don't you find that offensive? But people thought this kind of thing just 50 years ago. Women, if that didn't offend you, then how about this? In the 1960s, if you weren't married and you went to a bank to apply for a credit card, you had to have a man with you to co-sign for that loan. I mean, I don't know, women, you boo. <laughs> That's stupid. That's ridiculous. It wasn't until 1974 that there was actually a law passed that gave equal access to banking for both men and women. And uh, I mean, here we are, just 15 years later, that was the prevailing viewpoint uh, of male and female. And I find that, I think most of us find that so ridiculous and laughable and stupid today. Here, this one's just for fun. You know, they had these magazines, like a good housekeeping magazine, and uh, as a great Christmas treat, uh, they actually, I mean, this was the culinary elite of the day. They said, if you really want to impress, you can make a jello mold and put in it olives, pineapple, and tuna. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> I'm glad you're chuckling because this sounds ridiculous today. <laughs> Anyone old enough to remember eating something like this? Okay, <laughs> there's some hands going up. I mean, this was, this was, the, this was the thing in the day. That's 50 years ago. How about 100 years ago? Do you know if you went to the doctor 100 years ago with various infections, the cure was still bloodletting, which meant that they used leeches? You know, 100 years ago, there was no penicillin yet. People were still, I mean, this what you go to the doctor with strep throat, and I mean, today we're like, what were they doing? But that was... That was the intelligence of the day. That was the education of the day. How about this? Who remembers 1918? It's just 100 years ago. What was happening? The 18th Amendment to our Constitution, which banned the sale of alcohol. I mean, I don't know. Our culture is like exactly the opposite today. Aren't, aren't the intellectuals of our day? I mean, what are we trying to do now? We're trying to make the sale of marijuana what? Legal. You see what I mean? The intellectuals, the scholars, the top thinkers, their opinions are always shifting, always changing. They're dated, they're time bound. Near 1900, it was quite common for young kids to be sent off to work. In fact, in the year 1900, the census, they estimated that somewhere between two and three million boys aged 10 through 15 were working in jobs like, full-time, in jobs like these kids working in a mine. I mean, today, don't we just find this almost offensive, the idea that you'd send your 10-year-old boy to go work full-time in a mine? I mean, don't our elite, don't our scholars today, I mean, it's just so wrong now. Do you see what I'm saying? And here, I'll just show this again before I make my point. I don't know why I find this. Merry Christmas. Here's what C.S. Lewis said. He said, all that is not eternal is eternally out of date. Now, here's the reason I want to make this point. There are so many people, and I mean, maybe you and I are even in them, that we approach Christianity and we say, boy, there's a lot of things here that I like, 
But there are some things, I mean, according to like the learned and the educated, they're just kind of embarrassing today. And so, you know, I'll believe this, but I know that's, you know, old fashioned or, don't we do that sometimes? I mean, there may be people who are here today who there's some things about Christianity that draws you in, but you say there are other things like a well-educated person just couldn't believe that. I mean, I even hear calls to Christians like, hey, you better get with it, to which I'd like to say today, get with what? You know, the educated 50 years from now, are, you know, for our grandkids are going to laugh at what our educated say today, the same way we just chuckled about 50 years and 100 years before. On the other hand, I'm so blown away by this, you go back and read Augustine or Athanasius or Martin Luther or John Calvin. You go and read Jonathan Edwards you will find that they will touch your heart with their advice, with their counsel, because it arises out of God's word. And this is the point I'm making. The wisdom of the world must bow its knee to the superior wisdom of Jesus Christ. The wisdom of this world is time-bound, dated, and always shifting. You cannot stand there. This is the place to stand. Next point I want to make and I'll make it with a picture. And it's this, that the wisdom of the world is shallow and superficial. So let's just think about our cultural elites, those who are in the know. Why do we turn to them? Why do we want to hear from the learned, from the wise? Because hopefully through their great learning and their education, through their reading, through their know-how, they're going to hopefully make our lives better, right? But I want you to think about the kind of advice that our world gives and the kind of measures that our world thinks is common sense measures of the good life. What are they? Money, looks, power, status, achievement, talent, Intellect, and let me tell you something. There are many of us that stare in the mirror and we're unhappy about what we see because of the measures of the wisdom of this world. There are many of us who look at our bank account and we also find ourselves totally unhappy because of the measures that the wisdom of this world presses down on us. And by the way, I guess the opposite is true. There are also those who stare in the mirror and they're totally satisfied and those who stare in their bank account and they're totally satisfied. I like to just say to both, how shallow, how superficial. I know that throughout the Christmas season you're going to see a lot of pictures like this, so I want to just slow down and reflect on this type of picture, which is the wisdom of the world coming to bow its knee to a superior wisdom. And I want you to look at this picture. Who was Jesus? He disdained the measures of the wisdom of this world. He didn't seek status of any kind. He wasn't born in a mansion. He was born in a stable and placed in a manger. He didn't seek wealth. His parents are poor. We know that. We know that throughout his life, he had no place to lay his head. He didn't seek power or authority. Over and over and over again, he kept insisting, I'm not here to be served, but to serve. Listen, so many of us, and especially this time of year, it's so easy. I mean, Christmas has almost gotten co-opted by so much materialism and greed and superficiality, and that's why I just want to slow down. What? is the wisdom of this Christ child. It's totally different. It's not about power or status or intellect or money or abilities or accomplishments. What is it? Jesus rejected all those things. It's about a child, God himself who humbled himself. It's about a savior who lived a perfect life 
It's about a redeemer who went to the cross to die in our place, to take the punishment for our sin, because he considered a relationship with God of far more value than all the things this world holds out in its worldly wisdom. And he was willing to suffer and die on your behalf so that you could experience the love of God, the hope of the gospel, faith, and deep and abiding, lasting love. And I'd just like to say this. We should not be ashamed of the wisdom that comes from God. In Jesus' day, the wise of the world came and bowed their knee at the foot of this Christ child. Don't be caught up by the superficial things of this world. Ground your life in something far more valuable. The wisdom of this world is time-bound. This wisdom of the world is dated. The wisdom of the world is constantly shifting. The wisdom of this world is superficial. One last thing that I'd like to say. The wisdom of this world is totally inadequate. Now, as we look at this picture, there's one thing about this picture. I mean, all the pictures are like this, but it just doesn't quite capture the story. From a picture like this, you get the idea, why did the wise men go to Bethlehem? How'd they get there? What'd they follow? According to this picture, they follow the star. But if you read the scripture passage, that's, that's not how they got there. Look at, look at this passage. What's it say? It says that they showed up where? In Jerusalem. Why'd they go to Jerusalem? Because it was the capital city of Judea. They expected a Judean king to have been born. Who'd they go to? They went to the king, King Herod. They asked, where's this baby that's been born? We've seen a star in the east. And uh, Herod doesn't know. The wisdom of the world doesn't know the answer. Where do they turn? Well, he turns to the Bible. He, he gets the Bible scholars. He says, listen, we've got this question. Where's this king going to be born? And the answer comes from the book of Micah. They'd be born in Bethlehem. And so King Herod goes to these magi and says, look, uh, the Bible says you've got to go to Bethlehem. And the magi then go. And when they get there, then the Bible says the star is shining over the place. And they come and they worship the Christ child. Here's the point I'm making. Their wisdom didn't get them all the way there. And I'd like to just say this, that our reason today, our intellectuals today, our elite today, they might point out the problem to you, but they can't provide the solution. They might tell you that you need God. Your human wisdom might reach out and say, I know there is a God, but how to be connected to him? Here, I'll, I'll, I'll try it this way. I came across this very interesting article this last week written by Preston Schiller and Jeff Lee, the, Jeffrey Levin. Actually, it was a study, uh, a medical study in 1987. Here's what they were up to. They had done this study where they were looking at women who had fallen and broken their hip after the age of 60 and how they recovered. And what they found overwhelmingly was that those who felt a connection to God, those who prayed, those who had faith, they recovered at a rate so much more than people who didn't have a connection to God in prayer and faith. And that got them interested. So they actually went out and they found all the studies about religion and faith that had ever been produced, and they surveyed well over 200 different case studies. And after they looked at it all, they said this. They said that not being religious is a health risk factor. You know, like a health risk factor if you smoke. That's a health risk. And they concluded already in 1987, they said, look, if you don't have faith in God, if you're not connected to God, then when something happens to you, that's a health risk factor. Look, the wisdom of the world can tell you you need God. I mean, if you want to have any sense of hope or if you want to have uh, even a medical recovery from something that happens to you, you will do far better off if you have God in your life. The wisdom of this world can tell you that, but it can't tell you how to get connected to God. In order to find out how to get connected to God, you need a revelation from God. Which, by the way, and now let me put a fine point on it, that is what Christmas is all about. Christmas is not about us trying to find God. 
It's about God finding us. Does that make sense? Christmas is not about our efforts and our achievement and the triumph of our wisdom and philosophy to reach up to the heavens and, as it were, pull God down. Christmas is about God coming down and putting on display a wisdom that this world could have never imagined that God would take on human flesh, that he'd live with us, that because he'd love us, he'd die on our behalf as a sacrifice for sins, that in doing so, in one of the greatest, you know, it's like one of the greatest reverses of all time, he'd be raised from the dead in power so that those who put their faith in him, and let me tell you something, the intellectuals, they just scratch their head. They look down at Christians, they say, those foolish Christians, they're a bunch of bumpkins, and they don't think, and they don't know what they're doing, and according to worldly wisdom, if you're a Christian, you can't become a professor at a university today. I mean, but, but, people are being freed from addictions, people are finding new life, people are forgiving each other and be reunited with people they've been estranged from, and there's... I mean, lives being turned upside down, people who, who find prayer, more, one of the most, and, and the intellectuals may scoff at it, and they may look down on it, but they also scratch their head and wonder, how's this happening? All I'm trying to say is this. Here's the Christmas story. At the time of the birth of Jesus, those who were the wise, those who were the learned, the sophisticated, the elites, They came and bowed their knee before a superior wisdom in the Christ child, Jesus. And so should we. And so should we. Don't feel intimidated by the prevailing thought patterns of today. They'll be gone tomorrow. Don't be drawn in by the superficiality of those who think that it's all about money and power and status and wealth and intellect and talent. It's not about that at all. It's about having a relationship with God, finding peace and hope and love and faith and connection. And it won't happen by our reason, by our intellect, There's a superior wisdom that's far deeper, the one that you find here in Scripture, the gospel of Jesus Christ that connects you to God. So don't be intimidated in any way by the wisdom of this world. Don't be stopped by the wisdom of this world. The wisdom of this world must bow its knee to the superior wisdom that's found in Jesus Christ. This is where life is. Let's pray.